Welcome, Grace Point. We're about ready to start our online service, but before we do, I wanted to take a chance just to say hello to those of you watching online, and thank you all for joining us. I look forward to the time when we can do this face-to-face -face again, but until we do, I'm really grateful for the technology that allows us to meet this way. There's just a couple of things that I wanna share with you that we have going on here at Grace Point. A reminder about Operation Christmas Child Boxes. We still have a few at the church and you can stop anytime this week and grab one of those and uh, be a part of this tradition that we do yearly of giving to children around the world. It's still really important. And I'm really thankful that ministry continues to go on even during this time that we're in at a distance. And you can continue to give also uh, toward that ministry by hitting the Give button on your Grace Point app or by visiting gracepoint.cc slash online giving. Today, Pastor Tom is going to be bringing a timely message about humility called Not In It To Win It. And so if you want, you could go ahead and grab your Bible, turn to the second chapter of Philippians for that. And just thanks again for joining us. We're so glad that you're tuning in and we'll get started in just a moment. Good morning, Grace Point. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. We've had some technical issues. So for those of you who are watching the stream at home, unfortunately, the way it's going to work today is a little bit different. So uh, we're going to stream our worship uh, live, the music live, and you'll hear uh, a little bit from uh, uh, Anthony Torlone, one of our elders here. He's going to be taking us through a little bit of uh, hosting this morning as both uh, Tom and Terry are out this morning. And... Uh, but we've just had these technical issues, so you will get the full sermon basically as soon as service is over, like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. We'll put the whole service out there with the sermon, but we had some issues with simultaneously showing it in here and streaming it to home because, um, fun fact, uh, Pastor Tom has been home quarantined because he uh, had an, a, a COVID exposure. He's well, he's good, but he's been quarantined at home, and he was scheduled to preach this weekend. So we're going to see a video message from Pastor Tom in just a few minutes. Uh, and Anthony is going to share with us as well and have a pretty powerful soul exercise for us to do as we worship together today. And so those of us who are here present will feel all of that in, in real time. And then if you're watching from home, uh, that'll be popping in later, the whole worship experience. So if you want, you can turn it off right now and tune back in later, or you can do this now and then fast forward through worship later or we'll watch worship again. Heck, whatever you want to do. But I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad we're all together this morning. And uh, I don't know about you, but I need to sing to my Savior this morning. So let's stand, and let's sing to our Savior together. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. All right, let's sing this. I once was blind. I once was blind. I could not see. Chains of sin had shackled me. God in heaven, he heard my plea. Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. I will sing for
bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I thank you for this morning. We thank you that we get to be a part of your church locally and globally, and we thank you for what you're doing. God, I pray for every aspect of service today, that uh, even when technical things seem to fail, and they just do sometimes, even when those things seem to come up short and leave us wanting, God, you're still God, and we don't need those things. They're nice. They certainly make church smoother and, and easier and more convenient to plug into when we want that, God. Um, more than that, we want you. We want to encounter you, and we want to be in community with your people. That's what you tell us to do. And so help us to 
do that the rest of this morning. Be with Anthony as he comes up here and begins to share a little bit. And I just pray that the you know, word that Pastor Tom has for us today um, would really affect each of us the way you would want God. Let them be your words and not his. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, Grace Point. Welcome to a beautiful Sunday. It's gorgeous outside, and we appreciate that you spend some time with us today indoors. Uh, before we get started, we're going to go ahead and let the kids join Miss Meredith in the back. So kids, if you are part of the kids program, she is in the back waving. You can go ahead and head that direction. And uh, we're excited to have you in with us during the day or during worship and so that you can spend time with us during that. But uh, like I said, it's a gorgeous day. Uh, as Randy said, we are working through some technical aspects this morning, so thank you for your grace uh, this morning. If you didn't know, there was an election this week, someone said. Uh, someone mentioned that to me earlier this morning, caught me off guard a little bit, but uh, statistically speaking, about 50% of the folks listening to this are excited, and 50% of the folks listening to this are disappointed with the results, but at the end of the day, I think we can 100% agree that our good Lord is in charge before this election, after this election, and for many time to come. And so that is where we can rest our hope and uh, our excitement in. But uh, if you didn't catch this week, despite all of the craze of the election, uh, we have seen a significant change in how uh, the reality of COVID is going. And so... We as an elder team on Monday night spent some time talking through with the elevated results of how things are going with COVID. What should we do and how should we respond as a church uh, in regards to gathering together like this? Uh, this is week two of coming indoors and we appreciate so much last week. Everyone came and it was such a successful week. Uh, folks abided by the guidelines and expectations that we put out there and we so appreciate that. But as we continue to move forward and as we continue to address the reality of COVID, uh, we put together a quick little video. Terry put together a video for us to kind of talk us through just a, a few small changes that we are going to have and approach as we uh, look to the weeks ahead with COVID. So if we could play this video and Terry can walk us through it. Hey, Grace Point, it's Pastor Terry here. Hey, I just wanted to report that last Sunday, we had our first services indoors and they just went they just went great everybody followed the protocols we wanted them to do and uh one thing to make clear there's no rsvp and there's plenty of space we had plenty of space so if you're wondering am i going to take the space of somebody else don't worry about that come on in we've got children's ministry going on at 9 30 and at 11 o'clock we've got our high school ministry both going back in the multi-purpose room it was so fun to be up and, and having our worship team leading us in worship and all being in the room together. And uh, this week, Pastor Tom's got a great message that he's going to be bringing. I did want to let you know that with COVID cases going up pretty drastically in Ohio right now, that uh, here at Grace Point, we're going to continue doing what we're doing, 930 mask service at 11 o'clock, mask till you get inside at your seat, and then you can unmask. But if Ohio, if Delaware County goes up to a red level, a level three level, then uh, we here at Grace Point, we're going to be wearing masks indoors the whole time. Do our part just to be safe for everybody. So uh, how do you know? Is it going to be a mask or an unmasked thing? We're just following the Ohio guidelines. If it goes to red on the Sunday we're doing church, then everybody's going to be wearing masks anytime we're in the building. We're going to continue to stream it online. And uh, so I hope to see you this Sunday. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Well, good morning, Grace Point. Whether you are in the room uh, live or whether you're watching this from your home, streaming it uh, live or on demand, just a good morning to you, a gracious morning to you. I thought it might be useful today if we all could just take a deep breath together. It's been a wild, it's been a wild week, a wild month. It's been a wild year. As of the time I'm recording this, three things are true. Number one, we have all cast our votes in the 2020 election. Number two, both sides seem to be contesting our votes in a variety of ways, and it doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. But number three, and most important to me, is we can now stop trying to convince each other that we know the right way to vote. But don't worry, we've got plenty of other things we can argue about. 
Uh, we can still try to prove we know the right way to handle COVID or race relations. If those two things quiet down eventually, we can get back to proving that we know the right way uh, to handle immigration or poverty or gender equality. And there's always the standby trying to make sure that our friends and our family, our parents, our kids, our coworkers, our employers, our employees know that we are right about just about everything. <laughs> our country spent 2020 arguing with each other. We have researched our positions. We have reinforced our arguments. We have built up our ammunition to use against those who disagree with us. Because we're such experts on a wide variety of topics, we come to conversations ready to teach, rarely ready to learn. We've hold, learned to hold our ground and make our point and get our way. We've been trained to win, to excel. We are in it to win it, and we are proud of it. And don't you think, don't you think social media has done a great job of feeding our egos, turning our opinions into facts, and building up our pride? It's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. Muhammad Ali said that a long time ago, and I think it could be the American motto. It's hard to be humble when you're as great as we are. Well, as Christians, if we're honest, if we look in the mirror, we'll discover that we haven't really handled this a whole lot differently than the world around us. We have been driven by our pride and our own opinions. Uh, we have belittled people. We have slandered people. Um, we have worried about things just like the rest of the world. We often believe we are standing for truth, but oftentimes we find ourselves standing for our application of the truth. And a lot of times we've allowed the culture to both frame the argument and present the facts regarding the argument. Just like the world, we are in it to win it. But what if we did it differently? What if humility were the goal and not winning? Not being right, but being humble. Not winning, but showing humility. What if we believed, if we actually believed that humility was the key to holiness, that an, an essential ingredient to actually learning and living out the truth? What if we actually believed that? What if we weren't in it to win it with topics like COVID or the elections or race? in places like our homes and our schools and our workplaces. What if we were not in it to win it? That's what we're gonna talk about today. Before we do, uh, would you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful to live in a country that we can argue. It's a blessing, but Lord, it seems to have turned into a curse of late. And so right here, right now in this space and in this place, would you give us um, eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth from your word. Not our version of your truth from your word, but the truth from your word. Would you help your word to unite us, to humble us, to move us? God, would you do that today? We believe you can. We ask you that you would. We ask you to make us ready to receive that, God. And we say these things, we ask these things, we we seek these things because and in the name of the mighty Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to look today at Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, Paul wrote this letter to this little church at Philippi, uh, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago. In the first chapter of his letter, Paul goes, in, goes into telling them how thankful he is for them, how grateful he is for them, for their partnership with him, for the growth he's seen in them. Uh, for, their, for his imprisonment, for his suffering, for their prayers. He's thankful in the way that all these things have worked together for the sake of the gospel of Christ. And then in chapter 2, he starts off with this. Let me read you the first four verses of chapter 2. He says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. What a powerful four verses. In this first uh, verse, Paul is, is basically reminding the Philippians, since you're in it together, since you're in this together, he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness or compassion, the sense of this verse is that Paul is, is telling them a, a statement, giving them a conclusion, 
since you are united with Christ, since you are comforted from his love, since you all have the same spirit that moves you towards compassion and tenderness, since you're in it together. That's the sense of this first verse. And I, I just want to say out loud that this is what I see in you, Grace Point. I have seen you being united in, together. I've, I've seen you united with Christ, showing compassion and tenderness to one another, relying on the love that Jesus showed you and showing that same love to one another. I've seen it, and it's been so beautiful. I'm so grateful for it. But then Paul moves on to verses two through four, because in spite of Paul's gratitude toward the Philippians for what he has seen in them, they seem to be lacking in one thing, and it would appear that that one thing may be humility. Verse two starts off like this, make my joy complete. Paul's like, man, you've been doing great. It is so amazing to see what's been going on, but my joy is not quite complete, but you can make it complete. Here's how, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Like-minded literally means minding the same thing, to mind the same thing. Of course, Paul was not commanding them towards unity at the expense of truth. Paul must be assuming that the same thing is also the right thing. And I wonder what would happen if we put as much emphasis, as much effort into being of one mind, of minding the same thing, as we do trying to change other people's minds. How might that shift the conversation, shift our hearts and minds? He then goes on to say, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing. Not in thought or act or uh, uh, motivation. Nothing at all. Selfish ambition is seeking to win followers of us, of our way of thinking, of our way of acting, of our way of being. Seeking followers of us. Selfish ambition. And vain conceit is pride in something that's not worthy of pride, us, our way of thinking and acting and being. And Paul says, don't do anything out of those two motivations. And let me give you an example of what that might look like. When our youngest, Isaac, was seven years old, this was 14 years ago, I was in our great room doing something, and Isaac was up in the loft outside of his bedroom, and he said, Daddy, will you come up here? I want to show you something. And I said, sure, uh, just, just be a minute. I'll be up in a minute. And I went about doing whatever it is I was working on. Well, a minute or two later, the next thing I heard from Isaac was him screaming from the top of the loft, you lied to me, you're a liar, daddy. Well, now I took time to try to explain to Isaac that I was actually not a liar, that I wasn't lying to him, that lying uh, assumes the intention to deceive. And I was not intending to deceive him. What I was, when I said I'd be up in a minute, I was just giving him a figure of speech. I was very proud as I tried to educate my seven-year-old as to why I was right and he was wrong. I was so uh, intent on winning him over to my way of thinking about this, my way of seeing in this. I was in it to win it. I was in it to win it against my seven-year-old. Yikes. Well, uh, Paul goes on to say, instead of acting like that, you need to act like this. And he says, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. In humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Wow. Paul is saying we should consider others more valuable than we consider ourselves. That's a message right there. He says we should consider others' interests before we consider our interests. We should be humble. C.S. Lewis said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Let me say that again. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Let me go back to the story of Isaac and screaming at me that I lied to him. As I was explaining to Isaac how he had it all wrong, uh, the Holy Spirit very gently but very firmly stopped me. And I realized in that moment that by explanation to Isaac, while true, was not completely true. His definition may not have been technically correct, but to him, I lied. I, I hurt him. I angered him. He took my words at face value and I didn't hold up my end of the bargain. And I learned a really, really, really good lesson that day. That I can't focus on me and Isaac at the same time. I've got to choose one. That my son's heart and his confidence in me as his dad were more important than me being right about the definition of the word lying. 
I learned to choose my words carefully, not only with Isaac, but with people in general. That was a humbling few minutes of my life, probably a five minute chunk of my life, 14 years ago, and I remember it like it happened yesterday. The Holy Spirit switched me from being in it to win it, to not being in it to win it, to being in it for Isaac's sake, for he and I's sake. So that's all well and good. I don't think any of us would argue that it's good to be humble. But the question is how to do that. It's hard to do it. Well, honestly, I'm not smart enough to figure this out. So I asked someone who's a lot smarter than I am. Uh, John Hopler was the executive director of Great Commission Churches for years and years. He has counseled many, many churches through many, many difficult times. He knows and loves the Word of God more than any person that I know. He is capable, he is smart, he is wise. But most of all, for this topic, John is humble. And so I asked him to give us a few thoughts on how we could actually pull this off. What are some practical tips for living life with greater humility? Take a few minutes and watch this video from John. I've had the privilege of pastoring in several churches. I've worked with a church association in which I've served hundreds of pastors. I presently am on the board of the National Association of Evangelicals. And one thing that's very, very obvious to me is that people are different and they all have different opinions on a lot of issues. And we've certainly seen that this year with the COVID situation, a lot of different opinions on how to deal with that. The whole racial reconciliation matters and the police, law enforcement controversies that have gone on this past summer. And of course, we're right in the middle of a heated political election. You know, when people start talking about their opinions and controversies, their arguments arise, I notice that people respond in different ways. There are some that say, look, we just need to make the relationships more important than the issues, and they avoid the controversies altogether. Others say, you know, truth is important. These issues are important. You know, you're entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And so there it goes. People want truth, they want reality, they want results. On the other hand, people are more concerned for relationships as that category of people. How do you navigate this? How do we work through this matter of truth and then loving relationships? Well, the answer is found, of course, in the person of Jesus Christ. It says of Jesus that he was full of grace and truth, and Jesus was filled with humility. And that's what I'd like to talk about here. I wanna talk about a little tip that I found to be so helpful in working through controversial issues and I call it rounding the bases of humility. And you see in this diagram, you see the four bases there, and uh, just like in a baseball diamond, and it starts by stepping up to the plate and saying, we're gonna win in this, but we're gonna win in a different way than we typically think in America, we're gonna win God's way. And we're gonna win by pursuing humility, rounding the bases by starting first base, is having humility before God in prayer and recognizing that, you know, I am a human being, I have flaws, I have blind spots, I have biases, and to start with that reality that I am not perfect, I have things to learn. That's the beginning point, having humility before God in prayer. And then touching second base is having humility before God in the scriptures. Understanding that God has given us his revelation, he's revealed to us his truth, and coming to the scripture, coming to it as a learner, and understanding that God can teach us reality, what truth really, really is. And then third base, and oh, this is such an important one, third base, is having humility before my fellow man by being a person who goes over into their world and sees things from their perspective. It's that empathetic listening quality that is so, so very, very important. For example, on matters like, uh, as I mentioned, like the whole Black Lives Matter, the whole thing about police, it's learning to sit in the chair of the black person and understanding what they've gone through, while at the same time uh, is putting yourself in the shoes of those in the law enforcement world, uh, doing both, how vital, vital that is. And so that's touching third base, is being an empathetic listener. And then finally, 
If you want to score, you got to persevere in community. We are made to be part of a community. And as we round the bases, we don't trip and fall, but we go all the way through to score the runs and we work through issues. I think that is how we really, really win. And so rounding the basis of humility, and I've noticed this, that when an individual really makes it as his or her priority, not worrying about the other person, but just themselves to say, I'm gonna be a person of humility. I'm gonna work through my biases. I'm gonna be humble before God and the scriptures. I'm gonna be an empathetic person and I'm gonna persevere. I'm not gonna back up. I'm gonna persevere in working through issues like this and, and come into an agreement. I've noticed that it has a wonderful effect on everybody else. We inspire our, our family members. We inspire our coworkers. We inspire people in our community and our church and everyone wins in the end. So may God grant you grace to be a person who really, really wins, who comes away not only with truth, but also with loving relationships as you round the basis of humility. Wow, humility in prayer, humility in the scriptures, humility towards others, humility towards church community. These are beautiful things, beautiful practical ways to live out humility. I thought it might be helpful to share a little bit with you how I've walked through those four bases that John talked about. Now, I didn't know that these bases were a thing. This was before I heard this uh, from John. But let me tell you a little bit of my journey through the racial reconciliation movement that's going through our country right now. So when this first started and some black men were killed by police officers and, and protests and riots started and Black Lives Matter, both the phrase and the organization started becoming prominent, I began to, uh, honestly, my first reaction to it was to, to push against it, uh, to build up a wall of, of truth, of my truth against it, why what was happening was, was wrong and incorrect. Somewhere in there, the Holy Spirit, just like he did when I had my interaction with Isaac, somewhere in there, the Holy Spirit stopped me gently, but clearly stopped me and, and invited me to look at things a little differently. And so I prayed for the Lord to give me eyes to see this uh, from a different perspective, ears to hear it, not my own voice, but other people's voices, a heart to receive what was true and good. And I began to see less of the facts that were involved in all this situation and I began to be more aware simply of the lament that was in the African-American population in our country, of the sadness and the grief and the anger that they felt. Not necessarily trying to understand why they felt it, but to simply recognize that it was there, that it was true, that it was real, that it was painful. I prayed that he would give me a soft heart to even see that much, and he did. And then I did a refresher course in the scriptures on what the scriptures say about about love and unity and justice and forgiveness and anger and how we should think about those things and deal with those things. And that was a good refresher to me, not what I recalled from Scripture, but I, I let the Scripture um, re-inform me about what it says about some really important topics with regard to race and how it has happened in our country. And then I, I sought out some people that I know. I, I talked to the, actually the guy who cleans our church building his name's Mark. He's a small business owner. He has a cleaning business, obviously. He's a 47-year-old black guy. And I texted him one morning and said, Mark, if you've got a minute sometime, I would love for you to meet me. Let me buy you breakfast or a cup of coffee. I'd love to pick your brain on some stuff. Well, he, he called me like a minute later, and we talked for an hour and a half. I was so, uh, so grateful for him because I was able to start this conversation with Mark. I'm a 52-year-old white guy. I don't know anything about what it's like to be a black guy in our country. Would you help me discover what that is? Would you give me your perspective on it? He spent an hour and a half giving me his perspective, very gracious, as we went back and forth with me asking questions and him answering them. Since then, we've had five or six other conversations. When he's supposed to be cleaning our church, he's talking to me about, uh, about race and the history of it and where we are today. It's been, it's been great. I talked to my cousin who's married to a black man and asked her, what, a, what was it like to be a biracial couple in Sunbury, Ohio in the 90s and the 2000s? And she told me some of her stories of what it was like, the good and the bad. And so I tried to reach out to people to try to hear what their stories are, not to judge their stories, not to argue with their stories, just to hear their stories. And I was moderately successful in that. I did find myself arguing with them in my head 
rather than just listening. But again, the Holy Spirit was gracious to point that out in the moment, and I was able to back off and just simply listen. And then with regard to humility towards church community, uh, Michelle and I and a few other Grace Pointers spent a month going through some material together that was specifically written to white people to try to get a sense of race in our country. Uh, it was great to define some of the terms that we've been hearing, systemic racism and white fragility and just racism in general, all these terms that have been used and reused in such ways that they become very confusing. That too was a really challenging process for me uh, because the, the, the content of the material that we were using was not, um, was not theologically accurate in some places, which troubled me. Um, some of the facts that they chose to present were incomplete and that bothered me. But again, I kept asking the Spirit's help, help me to look past those things, look into the heart and the spirit of what's trying to be communicated. Help me to learn from this. <laughs> Help me to realize that I don't understand this very well and I need to understand it better. And the, and the Spirit was gracious to help me do that. And the team we met with, the group we met with, was a beautiful set of people. Not all on the same page. We don't all agree on the problem or the solution, any of that. But it was great to be together trying to figure it out. So that was just a, just a little example of a, trying to work through a, a current situation with humility when honestly my first reaction was nothing like humility. My first reaction was pride as a 52-year-old white guy in America, pride about the way people need to look at this. To be able to see it from a different perspective has been enlightening to me. I do believe it has helped me to see the truth in a more complete way, and I've re reworked some of my assumptions about the way things are. Uh, I've, it, it's emboldened some of my opinions. It's loosened some of my opinions. Uh, I think that humble exercise was and is really good for my heart and my mind all at the same time. So humility, we're called to humility with one another. And John gave us some great ideas about how we could do that. My next question as I read this passage was why? Why would I do this? It is anti-American, honestly. We are taught to be right and first and win. We're taught to be in it to win it. Why would I do this? Why would a common American Christian decide to do this? Well, here's why. Let me suggest this to you. Because pride is ugly and harmful and humility is beautiful and good. Because pride is ugly and harmful and humility is beautiful and good. William Barclay said, pride is the ground in which all other sins grow. Pride is the ground in which all other sins grow. And Thomas More said, called humility, that low, sweet root from which all heavenly virtues shoot. That low, sweet root from which all heavenly virtues shoot. Pride is ugly and harmful, and humility is beautiful and good. Why do we do it? Because it's the most impactful, most practical way that we can think and act and be more like Jesus. Let me read the, the next few verses from this passage in Philippians. Verses five through eight says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross having the same mindset in our relationships with other people, the same mindset as Christ Jesus set had. Imagine that. Instead of hanging on to his rights as a part of the Godhead, he made himself nothing. He made himself a servant. The creator made himself subject to his creation to the extent that he died for the very people he created. He died for me. He died for you. Talk about humility. Jesus was the only person who was always right, always just, always good, always loving. He was always the smartest guy in the room. Jesus could win every argument, every time, no questions asked, but he chose us instead. He chose me. He chose you. He was not in it to win it. He was in it to win us. The least we can do 
the least we can do is follow the lead of our humble king, of our humble savior, the one who died, who let go of his rights, who let go of his correctness and his ability to win the argument and simply came and lived and died and rose again for us. May he grant us the grace to live in the same way. What a powerful message that Paul gave to the church of Philippi years ago as he saw that they were in the midst of the tug of war between the desire for the pride in their life to tell them that they were in it to win it or the desire for them to be more like Christ and have humility develop within their life. Many of you may be saying, I get it, I understand, I, I feel it, I know humility is something that needs to grow in my life as pride declines, and I'll get to it. And, and as Tom answered the question of why, he asked me to help us answer the question of why now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the worship team to join me back up here because we're going to look through a couple more verses real quick that, that Paul wrote to the church is to answer the question of why now, why deal with humility versus pride in my life. I'd like, if you don't mind, if you could stand with me as we read God's word, these last two verses uh, in the passage today, and, and it will make sense as to why. So if we can throw the verses up here, it's Philippians 2, uh, verses 9 through 11. So here it goes. It says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, him being Jesus Christ, and gave him the name that is above all and above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The answer to why now, why have humility be a part of our life and a focus in our life is that at some point, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow and claim that Jesus is the king. We will be humbled. We will go through the process of acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord above our lives, whether here on earth or in heaven. Every knee will bow. That's the answer to why now. Why is now the time that we deal with growing our humility in our life versus that of our pride? And Tom thought it would be a great soul exercise for this week that as we go, that we spend time in bended knee. As a reminder that this is a position we will be in at some point. We will be on bended knee someday. And we will be answering to our Heavenly Father who is Lord above all. And we'll be answering for how we addressed humility in our life. And so as we ask you, as, as you head out today, to spend some time this week on bended knee, Tom thought it would be a great exercise if we actually start that today. So if you're able to join me physically, if you're not, feel free to have a seat. But if you're able to join me physically, I ask that you join me on knee this morning as we spend some time on bended knee, a position that we will be in at some point as we address our Heavenly Father. And as a believer, we come to this willingly. We come to this and subject ourselves to the Heavenly Father because of the decisions we have made. If we don't have that relationship with our Heavenly Father, we will come to this reluctantly as we realize that pride stood in our way of that relationship with our Father. So as Randy plays, we're going to spend just a minute in prayer. Evaluate where you are in that tug of war of pride and humility. Are you allowing the in it to win it to dominate your thought? And is that keeping you from a relationship with Christ? Or is that keeping you from spreading that relationship of Christ with others. Let's spend a moment this morning in prayer and then I'll close this.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you on bended knee, knowing that this is a position we will feel again, a position in which we will be, all of us, in your presence someday. We will acknowledge you as our King, as our Heavenly Father. And I pray that as we spend a moment here today, that we will wrestle with where we are uh, in our tug of war of humility versus pride. Are we in it to win it in our relationships, in our conversations? Or as Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 3, in humility, we choose to value others above ourselves. Lord, I pray that if we don't have that relationship with you and we come to this position reluctantly someday, that we take a moment now and acknowledge what a relationship with you can change our path today and for eternity. And that path of humility today allows us an eternity with you, our King. If that's a decision that we have not made today, I pray that it will stay in our thought and our mind and we will seek out your presence. Pray for all of us that we will spend time on bended knee this week, acknowledging you as our Heavenly Father over all of our earthly circumstances. And we choose this week that in humility that we will value others above ourselves. Thank you for this valuable lesson today and be with us as we go. In your name, amen.
it's amazing to be here and worship with each of you today. And uh, what a powerful message Pastor Tom had for us. And thank you, Anthony, for, uh, for leading us in that end soul exercise. And I know I'm going to carry that with me this week. And um, that's my prayer for, for everybody here, that we would just take that with us, that we would learn to have that posture of humility, even if in a physical moment uh, it's, it's challenging to do, that in our hearts that would be just the posture of our heart towards God, towards people, one another. This week, I want you to have a blessed week. Remember, we have uh, shoeboxes, few left over here. Those are due back next week. And if you're at home, uh, please come by the church, grab one of those. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And if you don't feel comfortable coming in the church, just give the church a call, and we'll bring one out to you. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next Sunday.